All right, you should be able to share now, Helen. Okay. Now, um, is it showing? Yes. Okay. And is it full screen? Okay. So um, I'm going to go over some of the some of the logistics of uh, being a tide pool docent. We have um, three programs, and one of them is the tide pool education program, which is active in the spring months uh, in the mornings, and we lead classroom field trips into the intertidal in um, basically two beaches, sometimes three, and we'll be going over that. We also have a roving naturalist program, and I'm really interested in, um, I'm really hoping that people are interested in doing this because there's increased visitation on our coast, and um, these are very delicate. These animals to be living in. And so if we have some people that are roving during low tides, particularly on weekends, to assist the public with, um, uh, exploring these areas, both with their own safety in mind and with that of the animals. Um, that would be really helpful. And in fact, the MPA is now um, starting two roving desert programs along our coast uh, for this very reason. The third is a, uh, touch, is a touch table program. And the Bodega Marine Lab has very kindly constructed a touch table for us. And um, we have a docent go to the lab, pick up animals and and cold water, seawater. They come to the site and um, we're able to, I have some photographs in here. We're able to, um, to have people have hands-on experience with these animals without needing to be at the ocean and not requiring a really low tide. So I'm hoping that some of you are interested in any of these programs or all of them. It's all of them are a lot of fun. So the equipment, we have two lockers, one in Jenner at the visitor center and one at the um, uh, Salmon Creek Ranger Station. And we keep two packs in each locker. And if you open up a pack, the, one of the first things that you see is a list of emergency contact information, the phone numbers for um, both the Ranger Stations uh, and the dispatch in case um, you need assistance from a ranger for any reason. There's also a laminated sheet of um, tide pool ocean safety tips that we talk about with other classes that we take out and also tide pool etiquette. And we'll be going into that a little bit later. And then in this bottom pocket down here, we keep some magnifiers. And it's really an interesting experience to look at some of these small animals close up. There's also a small package of um, miscellaneous things. This is especially helpful for the roving docents that are encountering visitors at the tide pools. Um, one is um, a drawing of what a riptide looks like and how to avoid them. Uh, one side is in English and one side is in Spanish. There's a nice handout on exploring tide pools. Of course, we have maps of the Sonoma Coast because you're actually representing stewards out there. Um, a list of environmental education programs that are available to both schools and adults, um, some volunteer opportunities within the Russian River State Parks, and um, a nice pamphlet on where I can take my dog. And the really nice thing I like about this pamphlet is that it's positive. There's some beaches along the coast where dogs are not allowed. Um, this does not approach it from that negative viewpoint, but rather areas that are dog friendly. And then we have some guides. Um, it's interesting, this seashore, Northern and Central California is really, really nice. It's water resistant. There's a nice index, color-coded index on the back. Unfortunately, it's out of print, but you can go online and uh, find copies for yourself if you're interested. Um, this little Pacific intertidal life, it's, um, it fits into your pocket. 
it's black and white drawings, but it's really, really good. Um, the drawings are representative of what we see here. There's nice text. It runs about five bucks. And it was out of print for a couple of years. And we were trying to round up as many copies as we could. They were going online at used book outlets for as much as $75 at one point. Uh, fortunately, they're back in print and they're uh, readily available if anybody's interested in having one on their own. And this is a nice, the other one is a nice quick field guide that's, uh, that's in color. It has rulers on it. Um, all three of these we keep in our packs. And there's also a list of recommended field guides that are in the folder that um, on the Google Drive that you're linked to. Many of them are, most of them actually are available through either the library, so you have a chance to try them out. And they're also sold in the Jenner Visitor Center. We also have a collection of laminated guides of one type or another. Um, the Sanctuary's Limpets program was generous with um, their multi-page color guide to both animals and algaes that you see along our coast. The Max Field Guide is there. Uh, Tide Pool Bingo is available. A uh, copy of that is available in the um, folder of handouts. And it, it has algae on one side, animals on the other. Uh, it's easy to print and take with you. It's kind of fun because if you're with a group of youngsters, it gives them something that they can look for with some kind of representative text. So, um, <laughs> with us and um, a, a calendar is posted on the Google Drive and periodically I send it out to people and I ask for signups. Uh, because of the way the tides work, we seem to have uh, concentrated field visits in um, like every other week. There's always a week in May that we refer to as the tsunami week because we have had as many as three field trips going on on one day over two or three beaches, and we can be doing this three or four days in a row. It gets really, really intense and it's all hands on deck. So I distribute the uh, calendar every so often and I ask for doses to sign up. Um, we arrange for a point person for each field trip with the cell phone and we get the cell phone of the teacher in case anybody has to reach anybody else on the day of. And then uh, the docents will pick up packs, uh, one of these packs from um, the locker, and we meet about 15 minutes before their scheduled arrival in the parking lot. So we can take whatever materials out of the packs that we want to use for the day. And often um, the schools are a little bit late, but that's okay. It just gives us time to kind of prepare. And before going down to the beach, we go over the uh, ocean safety tips on um, how the, if we, all of us keep ourselves safe. And we talk about tide pool etiquette to keep the animals safe. Now, um, I send these out ahead to the teachers before their field trips because um, the kids seem to be more attentive and they pay more attention in the classroom than they do once they get out to the beach and the ocean air and they're excited to get down there. So some of the ocean safety tips is to note safety warnings on signs, never turn your back on the ocean. This is especially important at Miwok Beach where we're walking along a sandy beach in order to get to the rocky intertidal. When you're in the rocky intertidal, it's pretty safe unless there's a swell or some unusual weather condition, in which case we'll cancel. But um, we want kids to stay away from the water. The algae covered rocks are very slippery. The rocks are sharp. Um, we demonstrate a three-point stance uh, for good balance, and we ask the kids, of course, not to go off by themselves. Now, these field trips are also accompanied by a number of parent chaperones as well. Um, be aware of incoming tide is especially important. If it's a very, very low tide, what happens is that the curve is very steep and it comes in very quickly. Today out at Campbell Cove, um, you have to be aware of it. We're, we're cutting it off at three o'clock. And the reason why is that you need time to get from the jetty, or if you've gone over the jetty into the rocky area beyond, you need time to be able to get back to the main beach and parking lot before the tide comes in. And it's pretty, comes in pretty quickly. 
So do we actually take kids over that jetty? You can. Yeah, they go. It's the older ones. Um, now, the Campbell Cove, we need a minus 0.5 tide in order to get all the way out to the jetty. The jetty is a really great place because it's, it, it is just like the rocks in a rocky intertidal area on open ocean. It has sea stars, it has sponges, it has anemones, it has all kinds of interesting stuff. But it's a safe area for the younger kids. The first graders and kindergarten classes often choose to go to Campbell Cove because we're not worried about um, ocean waves. It's a very gentle area. But yeah, some of the older kids, they do go over the jetty, cross over the jetty into the rocky area that's facing the Dega Bay proper. So we ask uh, that people don't pull animals right off of the rocks. Um, they're there for a reason and it can damage them. It can cause internal damage. A lot of them are blue blooded, meaning that they have no, um, no chemical in their blood for clotting. And so they can either bleed to death internally or they'll never find their way back on the rock. So it's really important to leave them where they are. Um, we do take little plastic containers and we'll uh, pass animals around in order uh, for them to see them. But we ask that if you touch them in any way, you wanna handle them with wet hands. You wanna make sure your hands are wet. The reason why is because um, one of the problems they have during low tide is drying out. And of course your hand is, your hands, dry hands are of course absorbing moisture from the animals. We always return animals to exact, the exact place where we found it. Their um, neighborhoods are very competitive. It's a very tough place for them to live. And they have adapted with their neighbors to a specific pool. Um, the rocks are really interesting. If you lift a rock, they're really interesting to see, especially with the um, magnifier, because there are a lot of little animals living on those rocks. If you do that, be sure to replace it exactly as you found it and orient it exactly as you found it. Um, those animals that are on top of the rocks are there for a reason. The animals that are living underneath the rock are there for a reason because that's where they can survive. If you place it in another area and orient it differently, um, they won't survive it. And then of course, there's no collecting live or dead animals. The dead animals um, serve as, well, their shells can serve as homes for Hermit crabs, um, the live animals, of course, we leave in place. We don't collect those. They, they're not going to live. Um, I've seen sea stars that people have brought up to the parking lot sometimes. And I don't know if they intend to take them home. I don't know um, the rationale for that. They're not going to live if they're brought home to a saltwater aquarium, and they're certainly not going to live up in the parking lot. So once we get down to the beach, um, Sometimes we'll address um, the kids. We'll talk to them about different things that might be going on. Uh, Bill here is wearing this yellow vest, which are also in the tide pool packs. And we wear those so that we can be easily identified once on the beach. Uh, one of the first things that I like to do is find a rock that's covered with these aggregating anemones. And these are actually animals. And if you ask the kids, do you see any animals on these rocks? Normally they don't because they, um, they close up when the tide comes in and they cover themselves with sand. And it's not just camouflage, but it's also to protect them from drying out and from sunburn. And these are, um, these are actual families of animals. They, um, they reproduce by cloning and so um, you see the division here. I don't know if you can see my pointer on the screen, but you see that there are seams between groups of animals. And what that indicates is that this group on the right is one family, one clonal family. This group on the left is another clonal family. And this seam is kind of the demilitarized zone that is maintained between them. When the tide comes in, and they're underwater, their tentacles open up so that they can catch food, but also they have another set of tentacles underneath which carry stinging cells, which are used for both defense and offense. Anemones are really aggressive animals and you wouldn't know it by looking at them here. And in fact, one of the videos um, that I wanted to show, but it's linked on the um, Secret Lives of Intertidal Animals document, um, is a video of 
an enemy's fighting. It's really, really serious. Um, it's the front lines that are mainly involved, but in enemies that go back three and four deep can also hurl harpoons of stinging cells at the other side. Um, what they're doing is they'll send scouts out to explore these areas because they want to expand their territory. And this is um, discouraged by the, um, the other families. So here we have some kids that are the enemies so that they can feel the moisture. Also, because these rocks tend to be covered with them, we don't want them stepping on them and climbing all over them. The way they reproduce is that one anemone, this photograph isn't very sharp, but it gives you the idea. Um, these animals can, can kind of walk across a rock. And so one half of the anemone starts walking in one direction. Uh, the other half starts walking in the other direction until they split. And they form two identical animals. And this is how they clone and form those clonal colonies. Uh, this particular uh, species does not replicate sexually. The giant green anemones can, can spawn so that they can, um, they can reproduce sexually, both sexually and by um, cloning. So some of these families have been there for quite some time and you can see this is some tar spot algae that is growing in the seam between these two families. This is a slow growing algae that gives you an idea of how long these families have been on this rock maintaining this zone between them. It could be decades. Uh, this is a close up of two anemones fighting. Uh, the blue green tentacles are the feeding tentacles. They have nematocysts, they have stinging cells that they use to paralyze and capture prey. These white ones underneath are the ones that carry the, the weapons. Okay, so these colonies maintain stability over a period of decades until last year. And what happened last year is that um, it was very windy throughout the early spring months, right into May, which is when this photograph was taken. Um, this is a very productive part of the coast because of the upwelling comes from, starts at Point Arena. And what happens is that very cold nutrient rich water is moved up to the surface and moved down along the coast by the wind. There was significant upwelling last year so that it was a very good season for breeding seabirds, for animals, and it also seems to have fed this algae that took over. Uh, we didn't have any tide pool field trips last year because of COVID, but it was also a very dangerous place to be clamoring over rocks because this stuff is really, really slippery. I was really concerned about what was going to happen to the aggregating anemones that were being buried by this algae. This photograph was taken a month ago. They've disappeared. And you can see them, they're on these rocks on the back here, and they're on the northern section of beach. I'm trying to wrap my head around what's happened to these anemones. I mean, I understand that when covered with all of that algae, you know, they're not going to be able to, um, to feed as easily. Um, I imagine that absorbing oxygen from the seawater is going to be a problem. I don't know if they just died and fell off. Anemones can move. They can, some of them can swim. They can actually move to safer ground, but they're, they're so tightly packed together. I just can't see that that happened. My only guess, my best guess, is that they died and fell off. It doesn't mean that we won't see them there. There are colonies of them back here, and as I said, um, on the northern end of the beach, they're still there. My point is that we are seeing changes in this environment over the past eight or nine years that we have never seen before. It's been, this populations of animals have been very, very stable. The waters are warming. 
We had a sea star die off, a sea star wasting disease that you may have heard about that um, has now mitigated itself somewhat. Um, a very important animal here is the okra sea star that you know used to, there used to be a dime a dozen out there. They were heavily affected and they're a keystone species which determines um, the biodiversity of other animals living on these rocks. Um, the mussels, for example, prefer the mid-tide zone uh, because if they're the closer they are, the longer they are in water, the more feeding opportunities they have, um, the less chance of, of drying out or overheating, but they're limited on how far, how far down the rock they can go because of the sea stars down there um, who are predators, who prey upon them. And so we didn't see any ochre sea stars for quite some time. Uh, two or three years ago, they, you know, three years or four years ago now, I guess they started making a comeback and we're seeing more and more of them now, but they are actually mutants. What they've done is they, there is a recess of gene, which enables them to tolerate warmer water so that they are, other immune systems are more able to fight off this Genso virus, which has always been there, which caused the wasting syndrome. And so in a way we are watching adaptive evolution in real time going on out there. Unfortunately, one animal that we used to see all the time, we could see five or six of them on every field trip are the glorious giant sunflower stars. They're about two feet in diameter as adults. They have 20 to 24 arms. They're very, very fast. And they are an apex predator in this environment. They are not making a comeback. Um, they were trolling deep water channels from Baja all the way up to Alaska and found one remaining sunflower star. And there's a lab at the University of Washington, which is growing them and trying to um, keep them going so that they possibly can return them to this environment. Since they are an apex predator and they eat urchins, um, this is one reason for the collapse of the kelp forest uh, north of us. And of course that impacts the abalone. So what we're seeing in some cases, it's like a cascade effect. Um, there are other animals that are making a comeback in 2014 and 2015. There is the marine heat wave where water temperatures were much higher than normal. And what we saw were animals that we normally don't see um, in this environment. They're from Southern California and they were migrating up Beach. Um, this child here has a container in his hand and they're passing around a shell or something to look at. Leslie here is one of our docents. She's a kid magnet. And it must have been interesting because you can just see her vest here. She's just buried in the. I see Steve smiling because he knows her well. These are the containers that we pass around. We don't have a fixed set curriculum. Um, our objective here is to give these students an opportunity to explore on their own and experience this environment. Um, they don't get many opportunities to do this these days. And um, it's important that um, their sense of curiosity is ignited and that they become interested in this environment. It's not well known, it's a very fragile environment. And we're trying to inspire um, a new generation of stewards that will wanna care for this environment when we're gone. Some teachers do have assignments. Um, they'll come out with quadrants. We uh, inventory a section of rock and this might take about an hour and then they're free to explore on their own. Other teachers have other objectives and this is all handled beforehand, but we always allow time for free, free exploration and discovery. This is Campbell Cove and this is where uh, you'll be going this afternoon. It's on, it faces the Harbor, Bodega Harbor, which is, you know, very gentle water. Uh, so we're not concerned about um, a child being washed away by any of the waves. And uh, Sarah here is holding, uh, the main star of this area is the fabulous Lewis's moon snail. This is an enormous animal and um, 
you can see the shell here with this big foot that hangs out. There's a close up of it. And if you touch this, what it does is the animal just sheds water so that it can repeat back with the shell. This animal is a major predator in this environment. Um, there are a lot of clam shells, cockle shells. And um, uh, one of the videos that I was going to show um, shows a moon, uh, moon snail in chase, chasing a cockle. And it shows the cockle actually defending itself and um, throwing itself uh, out of the way. All of these mollusks, all of these snails have tongues called radula, and um, they're either the vegetarian animals, their tongue is like a file, so they can file algae off of the rocks. All of them have a minimum of 14,000 feet, uh, 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 14,000 teeth on these tongues, oh my which God. seems incredible. Uh, others, this is a, a carnivore. And the carnivorous mollusks, their tongue is like a drill, so they can drill right through hard shells. And um, then they use a chemical compound in order to um, help them drill through the shell, so they have access to the soft meat inside. Um, this is a, a clam shell up here, and this is the typical counter suck drill hole made by one of these moon snails. Another thing that you might find out there are um, these things, they look like toilet plungers. And what they are is they're egg casings of the moon snail. And they, they um, exude a type of mucus and combine it with the fine silty sand and their eggs. And the first time I found one of these, I was walking down Doran Beach and I, I had seen them, I'd seen photographs of them, but I'd never seen them in person. And I got all excited, my husband's going, God, what, what's the deal? You know, it's a toilet plunger. It looks like some kind of plastic device. I said, no, no, you don't understand. This thing is filled with eggs and hopefully there'll be some out there today. Um, as I said, we often take the younger groups out to Campbell Cove. Um, you, you can be prepared to see other surprises as well. Uh, this group has seen a track in the sand here and it's a raccoon track. And the great thing about this was that you were able to follow it right to the water. Um, you could see where the raccoon had dug up a clamshell and taken it out to the water to wash it off. And these kids were really excited because at their school, they have a garden and they do have an area where they see animal tracks, but they can never see the story of that animal in action and actually what they're doing. So if you're out there um, with a group, be alert to other things that are going on. Um, later that day, we actually saw a bobcat walking along the edge of the beach and saw him kind of disappear into the hillside there. There are a lot of birds that can be seen from Campbell Cove. So we're out there not just to look at intertidal animals, you know, as such, but anything else that's going on in that environment. It's a very active, fun environment to explore. This is the ochre sea star, which has made a comeback. Um, these are not only on the ocean side in the Rocky Intertidal, but also on the rocks of the jetty out there at Campbell Cove. Um, their favorite food are mussels. And one of the videos that's um, in that document, that's linked in that document, is uh, a video of a, um, a sea star eating, consuming a mussel uh, what they've done is they have these tube feet here that are very, very strong. They have a hydraulic system of canals that control these tube feet that they use for locomotion, but also for gripping. And what they can do, they can uh, approach a mussel or a clam and they can pull on their shells until um, all it takes is a couple of millimeters for them to open that animal, open the shell, and then they ex ex exude their stomachs into the shell and digest the animal right into the shell. It turns it into a, a gooey soup type substance, which they're able to absorb through the stomach. And then when they're through, their stomach withdraws back into the animal. And again, um, I'm sorry, I can't show that video. Uh, my 
system, my upload speed is just not enough. When they disappeared, when the sea stars disappeared, it gave other animals a chance to get a foothold. And um, this is a wonderful colony of um, sandcastle worms. And until the sea star wasting syndrome, there was only one patch of these along the outer coast. Uh, there are several reefs of them, like in Pinnacle Gulch facing Bodega Bay, but on the outer coast, there's one patch at Marshall Gulch. Now you'll see them, um, they're, they're quite common. And this is a result of the disappearance of the sea stars who kept them in check previously. And this is a colony of worms. It's a very, very strong glue. Um, industrial scientists have been trying to um, synthesize it uh, because it's one of the uh, strongest adhesives available. And what these animals do, here's, this is a tight close-up of one. They have these wonderful tentacles here. And when the tide is in and washing sand over them, they very carefully, like a stonemason, select specific grains of sand that's going to fit on their tube and um, exude a glue, which builds these, builds these wonderful tubes. And then again, they are a colony um, like the aggregating anemone. I really have a thing about marine worms because they're really exotic. This is a bat star. And one of the reasons that um, we like to take magnifiers out there is that it is like all of the sea stars. Um, they're echinoderms, which means they have spiny skin. But when you look at them close up, the spines are really quite gorgeous. And many of the animals uh, that are out there, they'll look kind of nondescript or plain at a distance and with the naked eye but the features close up are really, really quite beautiful. This, by the way, funny thing here is, it's like a valve, an input valve that you'll see on any of the sea stars and that it takes in water to operate the internal hydraulic system I was talking about, which operates the two feet. At Campbell Cove, if we're lucky, we'll see it in the red octopus. Um, they're, left, they're often left stranded on the beach. And again, this is something that you want to watch for you're climbing over the rocks to get out to the jetty. This is a baby octopus that we found at Shell Beach. Now, my husband's holding it here. They're very, very intelligent animals. Um, you can see he was looking back at me as I was photographing him. They're just as curious about us as we are about them. If they're nervous, this guy's very, very relaxed. And you can tell because of the smooth red skin. If they're nervous, they'll change color. Um, their, the surface becomes mottled and um, kind of bumpy. Um, they can sometimes flash color, but they turn white. This guy is very, very relaxed. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is at Miwok Beach, and sometimes we have other visitors. This is a young elephant seal that came out of the water to join the class. Um, this is unusual, and um, this little blue spot here tells me that he had been under the care of maybe the Marine Mammal Center or some other rescue center and became um, too acclimated to humans. He was up here looking for a lunch. We called the, the Marine Mammal Center, but by the time they got there, he had disappeared. He had gone back out into the water. So again, this is just a cautionary note. Uh, be alert to your surroundings because you can have encounters with animals that are unexpected. Um, the stars of this area are the nudibranchs. And the nudibranchs were sea slugs. Um, this is quite large. Um, they're only maybe a few inches long. So this is a macro photograph of one. Um, the sea slugs come, they have different body forms, uh, different body plans. But they are a mollusk uh, without a shell. Um, these things here, are, are you seeing the pointer? Okay, these things here are rhinophores and they're sensory organs. Um, and you can see with the close up that they're not just smooth. And this is to optimize the number of surfaces um, accessible to the water. And they, they kind of smell their surroundings. 
these orange tip things are serrata and they serve several functions. One of them is that these are their actual gills. Another is that this is their digestive system is up through these serrata. And a third function is for defense. Um, they get away with being so brightly colored in this environment, the same way that butterflies do. Um, when an animal, a, a, a potential predator sees these bright colors, they go, oh, oh, stay away. This animal can hurt you. And it does. What they do is they feed on anemones and other animals that have those stinging cells that they use to defend each other and for, um, for offense. But they are impervious to those cells uh, because of a mucus. And so what they do is they absorb those nematocysts, those stinging cells into their own body. They're stored in these orange finger-like projections here. And then they can fire those in order to protect themselves against predators. The interesting thing is that they're not born with these. You know, this is something that they absorb um, through their own prey. This is the most common one we see out there. This is um, a hermacenda or an opalescent nudibranch, and they're really quite beautiful. This is another one that we see. This is a shaggy rug. It has the same body plan. Here are the rhinophores. Here are the serrata. You'll see these out at Campbell Cove, except they're pink. And the reason why is their coloration depends on their prey. And the first time I saw a pink one out there, it was really startling because um, it looked familiar to me, but not familiar because I'd never seen a pink one before. They'd always been white or cream colored or even brown out in the open ocean. And then I looked and there was a pink anemone close by. So um, it had been feeding on this anemone and it absorbed the color into their own into their own cells here, along with the nematocysts from that enemy, uh, from that anemone. And so there, you can see these, they're multicolored. This is another body plan. Um, this is a sea lemon and it's a dorid. And the dorid um, still has the rhinophores here and its gills are on the backside here. There are these fluffy gills. This is another dorid, a spotted dorid, and this is a sea clown. So you can see they have different body plans. They look different, but they function in the same way. Um, this is the touch table that the Bodega Marine Lab built for us. And uh, we had it set up in Armstrong for a family day in the park. And Steve, um, would you like to talk about what you do? Well, I'm sort of the liaison between the touch table and the marine biology lab. I go out in the morning and pick up large jugs of seawater and a large ice chest full of the critters that we put into the touch table. It's really fun to be out there at the lab going through their tanks and asking the student who's usually assigned to meet with me uh, what I can take. Uh, how many I can take. And um, anyway, I fill up the large ice chest full of these critters and take them to where we ever have the um, table set up. And uh, then Hollis and I and a few others monitor it, uh, answer questions, um, make sure the kids respect the lives of the animals. It's a lot of fun. And we want to use this in, in conjunction with the mobile education van, um, the stewardship here. And, oh, and this is just some docents at the end of a field trip. So are there any questions? Do the vans go out to different parks or do they go out to schools or how do you, how do you do the, uh, how do you take out the mobile touch tank? They can go to schools. Um, they can go to, um, we've set it up in the parking lot at Campbell Cove. And uh, on that particular day, there was a low tide, but it was very, very early in the morning. And uh, we had it set up there in late morning and early afternoon. So, um, you know, the, the good areas of Campbell Cove weren't accessible at that time, but with the uh, table set up there, it doesn't matter. Um, 
we're talking this year about setting it up in parking lots along the coast. And it could be on the weekends. Um, what it does is it enables, um, first of all, it enables hands-on experience with the animals, but also it extends the times that we're able to, to do this. We only have low tides um, for every other week throughout the spring. And those we have those in the morning. And so it's the only time that we're able to bring this, you know, this the kids out in the fall. The low tides happen to fall in the afternoon, so it's not a good time for them. So we're not restricted to any time of year or any kind of tide level for it, which is really great. So um, I went out to Campbell Cove a couple of weeks ago and climbed over the jetty. It was kind of difficult. Um, that's a rough jetty to climb over. Are all the beaches or all the locations equally inaccessible or? No. Um, uh, in that folder that I referenced, that I put the link to, there is a, um, there's a document that lists good tide pool beaches along the Sonoma coast. Mm -hmm. It also says whether or not there are restrooms there and also gives the maximum tide. Uh, one reason we like to use Miwok, which is the speech behind me here, right, um, is that uh, the rocks have good exposure of the animals up to almost um, 1.7 tide. And so uh, we have a lot more flexibility on how we can schedule. Right now, it's not accessible. What happens is that there's this seasonal erosion of sand. The sand is washed out. So this is, I, I monitor this beach. I survey this beach for the Beach Watch program. And I was out there the other day. We still have to climb over rocks in order to get to the end. And those rocks are only exposed because of the erosion. Um, by the time that we have classes scheduled to come out, the sand will have filled it in and it's completely accessible. Another thing that we like about Miwok is that it's very um, long and it's very broad. We've had two large groups out there at one time. Uh, we make sure that one of them arrives earlier than the other. We take them out to the north end, then we're able to accommodate a second group at the southern end. The other nice thing about Miwok is that um, they park at in the North Salmon Creek parking lot. There are restrooms there. When we walk down, there's the creek, which is uh, Salmon Creek is in the, at that time, the creek's not running. So it's running all the way to the ocean. And so it's, um, you know, it's like an estuary and environment at that point. Mm -hmm. Then we're walking along the sandy beach for about a half a mile. And so they're exposed to a sandy beach environment, which is totally different. Right. And then we get down to the rocky intertidal. But it's because of that prolonged exposure uh, that we're able to use this beach, you know, more often than we are the other ones. So when we when we have groups, how large are the groups and uh, how many chaperones and teachers are with each group? Um, we can have groups up to 80, 80 kids. So one docent wow. per 80? No, 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 no. Uh, we try to have a, uh, a 10 to one ratio. Okay. Yeah, for the third, fourth and fifth graders, lots of parent chaperones come out. And so, uh, and oh, and discipline is not our, our thing. Our gig is out there to, we are docent, we interpret, we explain what's going on, we answer questions. Um, the whole discipline on rock climbing, getting out of the ocean, that's up to the teachers and to the, the parents, but that's really, really a problem. Okay. We've had groups that are maybe five, 10, 20 students. Um, the group that I was talking about, that's 80, um, that's one school that brings all of their third grade classes out two days in a row. They bring 60 students out on one day, 80 students out the next. We have uh, one group that comes out every year from Willowside. It's a uh, seventh grade life science class. She brings a total of um, about 160 students out three days in a row. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I think it takes a lot of energy. It's, you know, it really does. It's like, <laughs> And, and that's usually during the tsunami week when we have other groups out there at the same time. And that's why I say it's all hands on deck. You know, um, we just, and, and she recruits help from other, you know, organizations as well. There are a couple of people from the Bodega Marine Lab that come out with her. And it's a lot of fun. It's fresh air. And it's, um, you know, you're answering questions. There's all this interaction going on. 
and you're doing this three or four days in a row <laughs> and you're really feeling it, but it's an awful lot of fun. The thing that I really enjoy about it, and I've said this over and over, is that there are always those kids that already have a thing for nature. I mean, my daughter was always filthy because she was always chasing things, you know, snakes and bugs all over the place. And, you know, they come out there and that's one thing. But there's always one or two kids, you see the light come on. And suddenly they're hooked on something. And that's really great. I remember, Steve, you were talking once about the little guy that was shaking almost. It was almost wiggling with joy, <laughs> at, you know, at the touch table. Almost it, wiggling. No, he was wiggling. With joy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And we're not trying to, we're not trying to um, do a lot of science out here. You know, in some cases we are, but with, with older groups, but the point really is to expose them to this very special environment. I mean, this is only available on two coasts, right? You know, and we're very lucky to have it here. It's a very fragile environment. Um, I pointed out what happened with the algae last year, which is unusual. We are seeing changes that we've never seen before. It's kind of whatever's going on to the ocean is concentrated, you know, into the inner tidal. It's a very, very tough neighborhood to live in because the temperature ranges between a low tide and a high tide are greater than any other place on the planet. Uh, when the tide goes out, these animals are faced with being predation, exposure, you know, to predators. Um, they're exposed to desiccation. They're exposed to a wave surge, you know, and each of them has adapted and developed some weird and wonderful means of being able to survive in this kind of environment and survive with each other. I mean, it's a dog eat dog world out there. Mm -hmm. And if people don't know about it and they don't appreciate it, then there's nobody that's going to fight for it. One of the things I saw a lot in Southern California that I'm not seeing up here as much are, um, are various urchins. Where, are they deeper out here or do you have less for some reason or? No. I, um, haven't, I haven't seen any. I went to Campbell Cove. I didn't see a single urchin. I mean, the, my daughter was like, where are the urchins? I mean, I'm used to seeing them covering the, the rocks, you know, so. Okay. Now the urchins are an interesting story. Um, before there was a red tide in 2011. Right. And they were quite common. Um, and, and it was a neurotoxin in this red tide and it was species specific and it only ran along the Sonoma coast. It only ran from Bodega Bay up to north of Salt Point, interestingly enough. One of the animals that we used to see all of the time was the big giant gumboot chitons. They're about this big. Yeah. They look like footballs and we haven't seen one since. I mean, we, we've seen a few, but very few since. But they're common everywhere else. This was knocked out by that red tide. It also impacted the okra sea stars who were just making a comeback from the red tide when the, sea, when the wasting syndrome hit. Right. Okay? The urchins were also impacted. Um, Shell Beach especially was a nursery. Uh, at the north end, you could pick up rocks and see the tiny baby purple urchins, which are green. They were all over the place. Mm -hmm. I saw some baby purple of uh, the green urchins at uh, Miwok hanging on to some algae last year and it surprised me because I had not seen any in that area. However, they weren't impacted up um, toward Salt Point, Fort Ross, uh, in those areas uh, where our kelp forests were. Mm -hmm. And this was home to the abalone and the abdivers. With the loss of the big, gigantic apex predator sunflower star, the urchins just proliferate. And so what they've done is they've mowed down the kelp forest. So they're there, but they've just, they're just on different beaches. They're in different areas. One interesting thing about the Sonoma Coast, it's just a series of pocket beaches, and you'll see different animals and different types of algae from beach to beach to beach to beach, neighboring beaches. Um, my favorite is Marshall Gulch because it seemed to have a lot of variety. Uh, Shell Beach is good too for a lot of biodiversity. We used to take the kids to Shell Beach, don't do it any longer because it's not spread out like Miwok is. And so they had nowhere to go. So they were stepping in and out of tide pools, all of these feet. And I was wincing the whole time I was watching this because it's, it, you know, it's damaging to the environment. 
Right. Uh, Hermit Beach was the only area where we had seen the larger red urchins. I don't know why. You know, the conditions were favorable for them at Kermit. It was the only beach where we saw sea cucumbers. So from beach to beach to beach, you'll see different populations of animals. Do you have a do you have a census of the different populations or I mean, do you do you um, have like a little guide that says this is where we frequently see this and this is where we frequently see that or or not? That's your job to compile that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's changing. And this this is what's going on right now is that we are seeing changes every year that we had never seen before. You know, I've been exploring tide pools for 20, 30 years on the Sonoma Coast. It's been relatively stable until that, that red tide in 2011. Mm -hmm. And then there was the marine heat wave in 2014 and 2015. Then last year we had this incredible growth of algae, which took over on a lot of beaches. And the ocean conditions are changing. You know, all along. I used to have a um, PowerPoint that I took into classrooms. This is what you'll see. I had to tear it apart. This is what no. we used to see. This is what we're seeing now. And of course, during the marine heat wave, we were seeing um, big uh, rosy nudibranchs, colonies of them. That's a Southern California animal that we had not right. seen. Um, we were seeing um, a large, it's a large uh, sea hare, which is a large sea slug, know, this yeah. big. And we were seeing a lot of Southern California species that have since moved on. And at the Bodega Marine Lab, uh, they were part of a study of the northward migration of a lot of animals uh, due to the warming waters, some of which are still here, some haven't. So we don't, we don't have black or brown or, or California um, sea hare this far north anymore. Occasionally we do. Hmm. Um, they were, we were seeing them and Miwok actually was one of the beaches where we saw them. Um, they weren't. They weren't seen at other beaches. Um, we saw some in 2015, but following the heat wave, they turned up again in um, 2017. There is a group of them, short-lived. So what, are, what, what species is that small, very bright strawberry red, but not white tip? They don't look like um, um, strawberry anemone that I'm seeing out at Campbell Beach. They're about the size of a quarter. They're, they're bright, bright red. Bright red or bright pink? Bright red, which, oh. really, which really surprised me. Oh, okay, okay. The, the reason I was asking bright pink is that the aggregating anemones that I was showing, you know, these masks. Yeah, they're pink when they're, yeah. yeah they, have a, they have a pink. The bright red, oh, I'm drawing a blank. Um, my favorite field guide is Dwayne Saps. I'll show you what it looks like. <laughs> I love the way she disappeared into the tide pool. <laughs> it was like in the staircase. Oh, it show. Okay, oh, you're gonna have no, to pull it. Show. Okay, put it, put it up in front um, of your chest. Yeah, there we go. Uh, this is my favorite field guide. We don't keep them in the pack. But okay, I let me see if I can put it to speaker view so I can see what it says. It's uh, the Beachcombers Guide to Seashore Life of California by Dwayne Sepp. S E P T. And it's in the document that I've uploaded up there right. on recommended okay. field guides. Right. This is really the most comprehensive for this area. And it's great with the thing I like about it for Campbell Cove is that it goes into a lot of the clams and a lot of the bivalves that you find there. Um, and yeah, because my bivalve knowledge is like nil. <laughs> I know, and this, this is the, when I started exploring Campbell Cove, it was really fun because it was a whole new environment. There's also um, another document that I've uploaded. It's called Life Under the Mud. And Campbell Cove, as you go out towards the jetty, it has very fine, silty sand. Right. And the animals that live underneath that sand, um, you, you, can read, you can read the surface, especially if the light's low and determine What's living underneath and and who built all of these little structures and volcano like things um i'll find it for you in here 
but I know that it's here. And I'm just drawing a blank on the name and of it's, it right it, now. It's a local species. It's not an invasive or anything. No, no I've it's local. Seen like only three or four of them the whole trip. Yeah, no, it's local, but they're rare. They're, okay. they're not as common as the other ones. Great. Alice, there was another question in the chat. Um, are any of the animals in our tide pools at risk to touch or pick up? The only animal that is at risk to you is an octopus. Really? Yes, really. And that's because it has a sharp beak. The octopus are really, really interesting because they're really, really smart. Um, they have a full complement of organs. I mean, they've got a pair of kidneys. They've got a liver. They have a large brain. They have all of this going on. Of course, their brain in, and their central nervous system extends through all of their, their arms. You know, so um, I can't imagine what it's like to be one you know, and to experience what they experience. Um, they have three hearts <laughs> and they have a sharp beak. It's like a parrot beak. And mm, I showed really... the photograph of my husband mm. holding one on his hand, mm. this. Um, he could have easily gotten bitten if this animal had been uh, nervous about what was happening. The, um, it's a, it won't kill you, but what it'll do is it, it just burns. And oddly enough, the only thing to mitigate it for a couple of days is to sponge your hand in as hot a water as you can. 